Last time, we introduced the coordinate frames of import to GNSS. Now let's work a little bit deeper and talk about how to transform between them. In particular, we want to go from Keplerian to Parafocal to ECI to ECEF. It's not as bad as it seems. Let's have a look. Here's our, our overall starting point, and it's got a number of things on it important to us. It does have the satellite location right up here, and very readily we can get a feeling for that from the Keplerian parameters. Remember there were the six, the last of which is the true anomaly that gives the satellite location as an angle past perigee. So the question before us is how do we take those Keplerian parameters and then come up with a location for the satellite which is Earth-centered, Earth-fixed. Now, you may ask, why is that the goal? That's the goal because all our users, or 99.99% of them, all the users of GPS, reside on the surface of the Earth. So they need to bring the location of the satellite into the same frame where they expect and hope to solve for their own position. So that's why we have to wrestle with these ellipt elliptical orbits uh, and satellites moving in inertial space and bring them down to a very non-inertial frame, Earth-centered, Earth-fixed. Here's how it goes. Take a look. This is just beautiful. Um, uh, I love this. <clears throat> we define a new reference system. It's parafocal. And we define it First of all, by putting one of the cardinal axes right from the center of the Earth mass through perigee. And uh, just to remind us of its origin, we call that vector P. In addition, we define a vector W, and it's perpendicular to the satellite's orbit. And it also has its origin at the center of the Earth. And then we use Q to complete a right-handed system. So remember, right-handed means that we would take our fingers, point them in the direction of P, cross them towards Q, and expect our thumb to point in the direction of the final, the third vector that defined the system. And if it has that nice property, it's right-handed, and that means that all of our results about how to rotate uh, vectors in one frame to get to another frame apply. So what rotations will we need? The answer is really shown here and it can be understood as a riddle. What rotations would I like to perform on PQW such that I bring them into alignment with the target reference frame. For the, t for the time being, let's use Earth-centered inertial as the target reference frame, and it has its principal axes xi, yi, zi. So at first blush, you might say, well, this is kind of a wild and woolly problem. How are we going to get PQW aligned with XY, y, XI, YY, and ZI? Just using rotations. Well, what we do, the most intuitive and pleasing of the, earth, of the rotations we can do, is we'll take P and we'll rotate it against omega right back here. And so that's a rotation negative omega because we oppose the sine of omega. So we take this P and we rotate it down into the equatorial plane where both xi and yi reside. The next thing we do is we take the PQW system and rotate it by negative i, right there. So now we've got both P and Q in the equatorial plane and W perpendicular to the equatorial plane. 
we have one final rotation to do, and that is now that we have P lying here and Q down in the equatorial plane, let's rotate P, now resident in the equatorial plane, by negative capital omega. And by so doing, we've finally gotten P aligned with Xi. Q has followed on merrily because we moved it down into the equatorial plane. It's now aligned with Yi. W is still right-handed with respect to P and Q and perpendicular to the orbital plane, which now lies in the equatorial plane. So it lies on top of Zi. So that's it. That's the, the really uh, deep operation that we perform uh, to get the GPS satellite location in, into Earth-centered Earth, uh, Earth -centered inertial. There are two steps that still remain, and that is, well, how do we define the location of the satellite in PQW in the first place? Because we do need a PQW description of the satellite to subject it to these rotations we've just defined here. So that's number one thing that's outstanding. The number two thing that's outstanding is we only got it into the ECI target frame, and really our goal was to get it all the way to ECEF. But as you can imagine, just by looking at this picture, the only difference between ECI and ECEF is that ECEF is running ahead of ECI by this angle theta. Recall also that XT in ECEF comes out straight through the Greenwich meridian, zero degree longitude. And so what we need is an angle theta which describes the location of Greenwich relative to the vernal equinox. And you have to know that that's periodic, approximately 24 hours. And so that angle just moves forward through time like that, and it has a name. It's called Greenwich Sidereal Time, and we use theta to represent it here. So let's pick up our two details and uh, make sure you're clear on them. Here's the first uh, issue that we raised. We had not quite started with Keplerian. We assumed we were somehow in the parafocal frame. And here are some expressions which give the parafocal coordinates of the satellite as a function of the Keplerian parameters. And in fact, I would draw your attention especially to this first expression here. We want an expression R for the location of the satellite in PQW. And this piece here is the length of that vector, R. Remember, we mentioned that first when we were talking about Newton looking at ellipses, and in fact, recognizing that as being part of the solution to the 1 over R squared force problem that he solved. Cosine nu is nothing other than the projection of R onto the P axis, sine nu, projection onto Q, and zero is the projection onto W. Recall, W is perpendicular to the orbital plane, so there's no projection of R onto that perpendicular because R, in fact, resides in the orbital plane. If <clears throat> we take this coefficient here, and just call it R, we can rewrite our expression as R P Q W R cosine nu times P R sine nu times Q plus zero times W. And we're done. We have now expressed the satellite location in PQW frame using the Keplerian parameters which the satellite gives us in the navigation message. By the way, uh, you can also do the same for the velocity of the satellite. I won't provide that proof here, but you can find it in any good textbook on astrodynamics. If you went ahead and worked it out, you could define V, P, 
PQW, as R dot PQW, and with some amount of work, uh, you can persuade yourself that the answer resides there. So, <clears throat> if we can accept that we have a decent expression for R PQW and V PQW, here are the rotations, and they do nothing other than inculcate those rotations I showed you on the last view graph. Remember, we brought P down into the equatorial plane with a rotation of negative lowercase omega. <clears throat> we brought P and Q into the equatorial plane by flattening out the inclination, a rotation of negative I. And then we brought P into alignment with the vernal equinox, a rotation of negative capital omega. So that's it. That's what we've done. Same rotations apply to V. So I, uh, th this is a dense little uh, set of rotations we've gone through. Please spend some time with it. Uh, I think if you, on the one hand, study the equations here, and on the other hand, study our earlier drawing, especially this one, that you'll satisfy yourself that it really makes sense and you'll become, become comfortable with it. This view graph shows the Earth-centered inertial frame that we've been talking about and superposed on top of it is the Earth-centered Earth-fixed frame. And so uh, take a look at the drawing and you'll discover that the familiar Xi, Yi, Zi is shown here and those with the exception of the fact that they're moving around the sun with the Earth, are fixed relative to the distant stars. And uh, so Xi, recall, this is pointing towards Aries, so we give it the symbol of the ram. And the main thing that I want you to pick up and appreciate here is that as the Earth rotates, the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed frame rotates with the Earth. So E, C, E, F. rotates with Earth. ECI does not. So this is the key distinction. And uh, of course, uh, the rotation of ECEF relative to ECI is about one rotation per 24 hours. And so that is captured by this growing angle in here. And this vector, called X T, for X terrestrial, points out through Greenwich. So it really is fixed to the surface of the Earth. And this angle, theta, G, S, T, is uh, the symbol for Greenwich sidereal time. So it's the angle by which the city of Greenwich has swept past the vernal equinox. And it grows by some 24 hours, and if we measure that in sidereal time, it takes exactly 24 hours to go around once. So um, uh, please appreciate that uh, ZT, the, uh, the pole of rotation, serves as uh, the same as ZI. So ZI and ZT are the same. They both point up in this direction. And of course, YT completes a right-handed system for the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed frame, so it too is rotating ahead of YI. Please spend some time with this. Make sure you're comfortable with it. It's very, very important. Here's the rotation now uh, completed that allows us to go all the way from the Keplerian parameters through to the location of the satellite in Earth-centered, Earth-fixed frame. We want that as the outcome because the user is navigating relative to the Earth. So they really need to bring the satellite location through to the frame in which they themselves are moving. And so recall, we had this expression from before, the top one, uh, R and ECI are these three rotations times the PQW, the perifocal coordinates of the satellite. The Keplerian parameters are readily translated into the perifocal, and then we do these three rotations to get to ECI. 
to get to ECEF, this middle rotation, we just need that one additional rotation in the equatorial plane by Greenwich sidereal time. That's the thing that discriminates or distinguishes Earth-centered uh, Earth fixed from Earth-centered inertial. So we just add that on as an additional rotation. Now note that that rotation is about the third axis, so it is in the exact same plane as the last rotation we did to get to ECI. So for convenience, just computational speed, uh, very often these two rotations are combined, and so we'll uh, uh, rotate by negative capital omega, the right ascension of the ascending node, plus the Greenwich sidereal time angle, and those together are known as the longitude of the ascending node. So if you like, you can go all the way from PQW, which was populated by the Keplerian parameters, through to ECEF by these three rotations. Please spend some time with this. Uh, it's worth your attention. We have uh, one last point that we need to make, and this is uh, that theta, GST, is measuring the angle of Greenwich relative to the distant stars, not relative to the sun. And uh, there's a small difference there. If we were measuring that angle relative to the sun, we would call that solar time, the familiar 24 hours in a solar day. However, because the Earth is moving around the sun, an angle measured relative to the distant stars differs a little bit from an angle measured relative to the sun. And in fact, we have the picture here. Here's the sun, here's our motion of the Earth is going in this direction. And if we start here and consider an observer that's directly underneath the sun, and then ask how long will it be before that vector is pointing in the same direction relative to the distant stars, that's only 23 hours and 56 minutes. That's a sidereal day. In contrast, if we ask how long will it take that vector to be pointing directly back at the sun, that's a little bit longer because we're moving in this direction. Therefore, the Earth has to over-rotate a little bit to get back and point at the sun. So if we define that as 24 hours, solar day, then the sidereal day has this slightly shorter length, 23 hours and 56 minutes. And here that uh, um, relationship is stated in a different way. So I hope this picture works for you. Uh, we have this little notation over here telling us that the red arrow means it's an arrow uh, pointed at the distant stars when it's pointed in this direction. So beware of this uh, relationship when you're working through the GPS nav solution. When we come back next time, we'll pick up two details associated with the GPS nav message. And by then, you'll be fairly well equipped to open up the GPS navigation message and get the information out that you need to do position fixing, even in a homebrew GPS receiver. Of course, there are little details uh, that we have missed, that we have glossed over, but those appear either in the textbooks, the good textbooks, or in the uh, interface control document for GPS. Thank you for your time.